Okay. <clears throat> Next up, Assemblyman Keith Wright. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Commissioner. Buenas noches, Toto. That's pretty good, right? Yo soy Assemblyista Keith Wright. Wasn't bad, right, Adreno? Not bad. All right. Um, I am glad to be here this evening. It is most important and most, uh, it's indicative of the mayor's commitment to housing that he has his first town hall meeting up here in Washington Heights. We have 53,000 units up here in Washington Heights. As chairman of the Assembly's Housing Committee, I take affordable housing very seriously. I live in the exact same rent-stabilized apartment that I grew up in. I pay exactly $1 a month rent. If you think I'm gonna tell you my rent, you're crazy. But our affordable housing has to be treasured and I thank the mayor for his commitment and what they did and what the Rent Guidelines Board did this past June has to be commended. I think we need to get a round of applause for what they did. To have a zero rent increase for one year, for two year leases, two, two year leases to have a 2%, it's un, unbelievable. In the state level of government, we did some great things. We've passed some, 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 some good housing laws that we've never passed before. Was it enough? No, it was not. But we have all the elected officials here. We have all the deputy mayors here. We have all of you activists here. So we will try to strengthen those laws this year. We will march again, we will pick it again, we will demonstrate again, and with some of us will get arrested again to make sure that we make sure that our neighborhoods stay the way they need to be. So I just wanna say that we will walk together again, we will do everything together again to make sure that we pass some real affordable housing in the state level of government. So I just wanna say thank you for coming out, thank you to the mayor, siempre adelante. Thank you, Assembly Member. <clears throat> I'd like to bring up Assembly Member Herman Denny Farrell. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm one block away from my district. It's on the other side of the street. I made a mistake. I got to get it back next time. But it's a wonderful school. Play a great place to be. It is a pleasure to be here but I think my voice is not necessary. Everyone has said it, only not everybody wants to hear it, so I'm gonna say thank you for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here, and I look forward to the rest of the evening. Thank you. So I'd like to invite up our MC for the evening, Council Member Idanis Rodriguez. Buena noche. Come on, buena noche. The city has never had a more progressive mayor in our history than Mayor B. de Blasio. Let's give the other commissioner a big round of applause. Come on, let's stand up. Let's give him a big round of applause. Let's show what Naughty Manhattan know how to receive a great leader, a great friend. Thank you. Look, I was at the council in my first time, and I don't recall the previous administration coming to my community. In my recollection, I only remember one at the Isabella Nursing Home. In the last year, this mayor has been in our community four times. Okay, four times. Come on. That show, that's called respect. Making great announcements. When he went to Prison 34, announcing that Prison 34 was the one leading the community engagement. No, he showed respect. When he went to PS5, announcing 
that the UPK will be expanding this year equal respect and equal investing in our future. So, para mí es muy importante nosotros reconocer que hay un alcalde que le ha dado el respeto a nuestra comunidad. Yo fui concejal en primer término y solamente recuerdo una vez que vino ese alcalde anterior, el alcalde Bill de Blasio en este año ha venido cuatro veces a nuestro distrito, ¿ok? Eso se llama respeto. But tonight is our time to hear from our leader. The leader that has shown that it is possible to stand with the tenants. It is possible to support the working class and middle class and work with the 1% in our city because everyone should be able to do well in our society. So we will hear from Mayor de Blasio how he's leading this city, protecting tenants' rights. That's the most important. Hoy nosotros vamos a escuchar del alcalde Bill de Blasio lo que tiene que ver con su visión, su inversión is putting the money where the word is. Some people call themselves progressive because it's popular to say that you're progressive. But you have to show, you have to work hard to close the gap that has been widening and widening for decades and centuries. Here we have a person that has been working very hard with great commissioners. So let's give also a big round of applause to the great commissioner that can hear the mayor. Pero... This night, because the time is limited, is not to hear from all the elected officials who say all the great things, but just to hear what is his plan to continue supporting our tenants that in many parts of the city they've been pushed out. And he has a plan how to support them. Señoras y señores, un fuerte aplauso y recibámoslo a nuestro alcalde, Bill de Blas. Thank you, brother. Muchas gracias, mi hermano y danas. <laughs> Buenas noches a todos. Es un gran honor estar con ustedes esta noche. ¿Puedo hablar un poquito en inglés? Sí. Gracias. I, <laughs> yeah, I use English sometimes. <laughs> I want to thank Idanis Rodriguez. I have to tell you, some of you will remember when Idanis Rodriguez was a student activist at the City University of New York. And he was a great student activist. He was all heart, all soul. He fought for what was right. And I remember people saying then, watch Idanis Rodriguez. He's going to be a great leader of this community. And I can tell you at City Hall every day, He is one of the visionaries at City Hall. He's one of the people who believes that something truly better can happen for this community, and he lives it, he acts it with passion. Let's thank Idanis Rodriguez for all he does. I'm going to, in a moment, thank our elected officials who are here, all of them key partners in our work. But let me take a moment first to thank everyone, because you care about this community. You care, and that's why you're here tonight. You want to make a change. I want to thank the sponsors of the event, the Community League of Washington Heights, and I hope you know the work of the Community League because it's amazing, and one example is powerful, which is 552 Academy Street in Inwood. This was a building that was so dangerous, literally was evacuated, that human beings couldn't live anywhere. They couldn't live in that building, it was so bad. And the Community League took it over and made it into a beautiful home for people in this community. Let's thank them for all they do. And let us thank the Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. We're going to talk tonight about how to protect affordable housing and how to stop illegal evictions. The Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation does that all the time. We depend on them to provide legal services. We support them to provide legal services to people in need in the community, and they do a fantastic job. So let's thank them for their great work. It is a special pleasure to be at Gregorio Luperon High School 
which is a wonderful school, which is doing so much for our young people, a beautiful school, but I especially like this school because once there was a young, aspiring public servant who was a teacher in this school, his name, Idanis Rodriguez. And I want to thank Principal Francisca Lopez for her great leadership of this school, making it such a wonderful place for the community. And a special thank you to Chasen Polinario, who did the Pledge of Allegiance earlier. Oh, he's going to do it. I'm going to pre-thank him then. <laughs> We're going to hear from Chasen. And uh, he is a hardworking young man from this community. He is an honor student. I saw him a few minutes ago. I said, Chasen, what is your vision? He said, I want to go to college. I said, okay, what college do you want to go to? He said, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, one of the finest technology colleges in the world. So I say to Chasen, you have to aim high to achieve your goals. So he's doing the right thing. He's aiming high. And that's what we aspire to for the whole community. You'll tell me when the Pledge of Allegiance is. I want to thank, as I said, the elected officials. We ask a lot of our elected officials, this administration asks them for a lot of partnership to get a lot done. Those who represent the city, we're constantly working together. Those who have a very tough mission representing us in Albany, not for the timid, is it? It's a tough situation in Albany to get a fair share for communities like this, but they work very hard on our behalf. So let's I'm name them all. I want you to thank them all. Our public advocate, Tish James, our Borough President of Manhattan, Gail Brewer, State Senator Adriano Espaillat, Assemblymember Guillermo Linares, Assemblymember Denny Farrell, Assemblymember Keith Wright, Councilmember Jamani Williams, and Councilmember Mark Levine. We thank you all. Now, tonight I'm looking forward to your questions and your concerns. But let me tell you something I know already from talking to people all over this city. When I ran for this office all of 2013, talking to people in every neighborhood, and conversations I've had ever since, it keeps coming back to the same thing. People want to know, how will I be able to afford to live in my own neighborhood? How will I be able to afford to live in the neighborhood I love, the neighborhood I've called my home, the neighborhood, the generations of my family, in so many cases, were a part of and built and made great? That's the question I hear everywhere. Am I still going to be able to live here in the place I love? We are focused on addressing this question in so many ways. I'm going to give you a few of the points tonight of what we're doing. But in Washington Heights and Inwood, so much of what we're trying to do is coming together in this neighborhood. This is one of the places where the fight to protect affordable housing is most intense, where the need is greatest. That's why we're here tonight. If you're going to talk about protecting affordable housing, you have to talk about Washington Heights and Inwood. And that's why it is a priority of this administration. Now, we know what's been going on. We know that the cost of living, particularly the cost of housing, has kept going up for years and years. Unbelievably higher than we could ever have imagined. Think back 10 or 20 years ago, no one could have predicted the cost of housing being what it is today. But what's happened at the same time? For most New Yorkers, wages and benefits haven't improved. So we have a very uneven equation, the cost of housing going up, but the resources we have, our families have, not moving the same way. That's what has created this affordable housing crisis. People have been fighting in this community to address it in so many ways. This is a community rich with activists and leaders and community organizations. You've been fighting to preserve affordable housing and to get more. The difference now and it's a big difference from the past. The difference now is you have the full weight of City Hall behind you, on your side. <laughs> 53,000, you heard it before, 53,000 rent-regulated units in this neighborhood, in Washington Heights and Inwood. 53,000 families. Now let's take a moment to thank all those who serve us in Albany that are gathered here because they fought for tougher rent regulation for all of us. So let's thank them for what they achieved in Albany. And there's more we have to do in Albany going forward because we're not done. We need 
better and stronger rent regulations for the future. But there's a lot we can do right here, and that's what we're focused on. In the coming years, as part of our affordable housing plan, we plan to begin by building and preserving a thousand units of housing here in Washington Heights and Inwood. A thousand units for a thousand families, but our goal is to go much farther so that we can reach thousands of families, protect the affordable housing they have now, and build new affordable housing for the community. Our Inwood neighborhood plan is going to be a key part of this initiative, but also everything we're doing to preserve affordable housing in place and to protect the rights of tenants whose rights have been trampled too often, who have a legal right in so many cases to decent housing and have it taken away by unscrupulous landlords. We're changing that reality. And, hermanos y hermanas, we have 2,100 apartments in this neighborhood, in Washington Heights, and with 2,100 apartments in our housing authority, in NYCHA, that we will not only protect, because we will protect NYCHA, we will ensure NYCHA is for the people, for the long haul, but we will also make NYCHA a better place to live, which is long overdue. Let's face it, the rules of the game used to be that the market controlled everything and the developers called the tune, and their vision is what dominated our neighborhoods. We are changing that. We're saying very clearly, affordable housing has to be part of any new development that we authorize in this city. Affordable housing has to be a part of it. It is now required under this administration. It's not optional. The people demand affordable housing. So we don't allow new development that we authorize through the actions of this government. We don't allow it without affordable housing. It's as simple as that. It is now required in this city. And that is going to change things for the long run. As I said, certain developers were used to having their way. Certain bad landlords were used to having their way as well. They would push people out they would harass people. They'd make apartments unlivable and buildings unlivable just to be able to get new people in and higher rents. We've taken action. We're working with the state attorney general. We're prosecuting bad landlords who do that to people. They are going to face criminal charges. It used to be that a landlord could call you every single day, could knock on your door and say, I want to buy you out, I'm going to give you money if you leave your apartment, I want to buy you out, you should take the buyout. And people felt pressured and they felt overwhelmed. And you know what happened? Sometimes people took a check and they thought, this is great, I have a check in my hand, I've got money, and in a few months that check was used up and they no longer had affordable housing and they couldn't find any new affordable housing. That's what happened to too many people. But with the help of the city council, that is now illegal in New York City to harass tenants in that way and force them to take a bad buyout. It used to be that if you were being treated illegally as a tenant, you were being pushed out of your apartment or you weren't being told your rights or you were being asked to pay a higher rent than you were legally supposed to pay, that if you wanted to challenge a bad landlord, you had to do it on your own. And if you had to go to housing court, you either had to pay for a lawyer. If you couldn't afford to pay for a lawyer, you didn't have a lawyer. But the bad landlord had a lawyer. Now, again with the help of the city council, if you are being harassed by your landlord, if you're being forced out of your apartment illegally, call 311 and we will provide a legal aid and legal services lawyer to you for free. Idan has talked about putting our money where our mouth is. We are now going to, in the next year, we're going to put 60 million, 60 million dollars into free legal services for the people of New York City. <laughs> 10 times more than it was just a few years ago. Just a couple more quick things and then we look forward to everything you want to say and ask. One of the reasons it was so important to be here now is because We've achieved something through our Rent Guidelines Board that never has been achieved before. For so many, 
millions of people that live in this city live in rent-regulated apartments. And for years and years, when it was time for the Rent Guidelines Board to look at a rent increase, unfortunately, the rent increase didn't often reflect the reality of what tenants were going through and the real costs that were going on in their buildings. Too often, those increases were too high. We said we're going to change things. We're going to actually look at what's happening economically with the buildings people live in. We're going to decide what's a fair rent increase depending on the actual numbers, the actual facts. Well, guess what? The Rent Guidelines Board looked at the facts and they decided based on the facts that this year in New York City for rent regulated tenants, if you want a one year lease, there will be no increase, 0% increase in your rent. If you want a two year lease, it is a 2% increase, the lowest ever for a two year lease. Now, 2% for two years. I want to remind you all, everyone has to make their own decision. If you live in a rent-regulated apartment and your lease is up, you may prefer one year for zero. Or you may think two years at 2% is good for you because it's more stability and more certainty. It's a choice you should look at carefully. But either way, it's a better choice than we've ever had before. And it protects people. We've been out telling people all over the community, Washington Heights and Inwood, about these facts. So no landlord tells you you need to pay more than you should. The law is the law. They can only offer you a one-year lease at 0% increase or two-year at 2%, nothing else. So we've gone to 9,000 families already and told them about their rights. And tonight, in addition to what Idanis and I will share with you, we have some tenant support specialists right here in the room tonight. If you have any questions about your family and your building and problems and challenges you're having, we have tenant support specialists here tonight who are ready to help you. Or at any point, you can call 311 for help you need. Again, if you need legal services help and you're being harassed, if you need help with repairs that your landlord's not making, you can call 311. And a brand new website we've just launched, neighborhoods.nyc. Neighborhoods.nyc, which will give you so much information about all the things we have available to help you in this neighborhood. The bottom line is we are here to protect the people, to protect tenants, to protect people who just want to live in the neighborhood they love. That's our mission. That's what we believe in. Puedo hablar un poquito en español? Señor moderator, gracias. Sé que a ustedes como a Tanta gente en nuestra ciudad les preocupa el aumento de los alquileres. Estoy aquí esta noche para escucharlos y decirles que la ciudad ha priorizado la protección de derechos de inquilinos y los servicios legales para las personas que enfrentan desalojos ilegales. Quiero que sepan que tienen el apoyo de la alcaldía para que conserven sus viviendas. Y pueden seguir viviendo en sus vecindarios. Estamos creando y preservando, preservando más de mil apartamentos de bajo costo en Washington Heights y en Inwood ayudando a enfrentar a los malos caseros. Y manteniendo alquileres bajos en los apartamentos de renta estabilizada. Si necesitan ayuda, llamen al 311 o visiten neighborhoods.nyc a cualquier hora. Muchas gracias a todos. Thank you, Thank you Mayor. And before calling on Jason Pulinario uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance, I, also, I want to recognize Juan Villar, who was a visionary of creating Luperon High School also, uh, who is here with us. So thank you, Juan.
Uh, you know, life is about struggling and being able to move forward. So Jason not only is a top student, but also he's a role model. After losing his father, so he became the role model to all his brothers and sisters. So, and he's a top student here at Luperon High School. Let's receive for the Pledge of Allegiance, Jason Pulinario. Thank you. Buenas noches. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. So, Mayor, now is the time, right? Do it. Now the floor is open. I know that there is race in our community that have questions. We want to go straight to the question so that we can maximize the use of our mayor. Stephen. Thank you. Well, first off, um, Mr. Mayor, I, I really want to thank you for being such a refreshing voice from City Hall. You know, uh, I grew up in this neighborhood in Washington Heights, and... Bloomberg and Giuliani didn't do anything like what you're doing as far as being a voice for working people and so on. But I just want to get to the question, though. Thank you, brother. That is, what is affordable? You know, I think everything you're talking about is great, but what is affordable? You know, this, what we need is low-income housing for it to be affordable to the people on my block. So I, I just want to hear what you have to say about that. The, the calculations of the AMI and the recent deal, I think it was, you know, it was good that we had a fight uh, against the Republicans up in Albany. Now, it was a hard one, but the, the, what came out of that, you know, I don't know if it was the, the best thing as far as calculating affordability. So I'd like you to speak on that. I appreciate the question. That's one of the other questions I get everywhere I go in New York City. Uh, look, there are people of all walks of life trying to get affordable housing in this city. There are people who, a family that's got two jobs and makes 80,000, 90,000, they're still trying to get affordable housing. But you're exactly right, there's a lot of people in the city who are struggling to make ends meet. In fact, I often have quoted the statistic, 46% of New Yorkers living at or near the poverty level. That means, and it answers your question, 46% of the people in this city are part of families that make $40,000 or less, making the 30s, making the 20s. That is a crucial part of the affordable housing plan. So the truth is, we have affordable housing for people at different levels, but we know that where many, many, many people in this city need to be is affordable housing for people who make 20,000 to 30,000, 30,000 to 40,000. That's where a big chunk of our affordable housing plan is. And we're talking about this community. We try to tailor the affordable housing. So we're talking about the Inwood neighborhood plans and other things that will allow us to create more affordable housing we tailor it to the income needs of the community. And I assess in this community, a lot of people need affordable housing who make 20,000 to 30,000, 30,000 to 40,000 as a family. So I'm gonna be going around. Uh, Mr. Bonnet's tenant. Oh, Maria, what is who? <laughs> she was gonna take over as moderator. I was, I was, <laughs> that, yeah, that's what I do. First of all, Mayor, thank you so much for hosting this meeting here in the Heights. It's really important to us. And for our two council members, uh, Levine and Rodriguez, who have been staunch supporters when it comes to making sure that we provide free legal services. So you mentioned that you will be adding $60 million to the budget, and we're very excited about that because we're firm believers since 1979 that everyone should have an attorney who is facing eviction. So in terms of the allocations for the $60 million, just a recommendation, it's really important to continue supporting community-based based organizations who are in the communities that are being affected, who talk the language of the people who are coming through the doors and look like the people who are coming in. So just in terms of making Amen. sure that that gets infused in the community. Thank you. This administration, I think it's a very powerful point, this administration believes that we provide help, we provide services best in a culturally competent way. If we know the community, we know the cultural community, we know the language of the community, and we want to work with nonprofit organizations that are on the ground in the community. That's what we believe in. We also believe that it's very important, especially in a neighborhood like this that's feeling such development pressure, that people know if they are being harassed, if, if your landlord's harassing you or not informing you of your rights or trying to force you out of an apartment or not making repairs to try and force you out, 
that you can literally, it's as easy as calling 311 and you can get the help. And in many, many cases, the help will be provided by lawyers right in the community. Thank you. Arelis. Around, so everyone, we have the opportunity, okay, to ask a question. Hi. We represent a group here, and we know that there is still buildings, abandoned buildings, or no as in the past. But we come from an effort that we're able to uh, renew the building. So we are now in a, we want to do the second part of that project. Will you be willing to support us? We have already present our proposal, our project to Councilman Idanis and Mark Levine. And we are asking you for your support. I want to make sure I understand, and if Adonis and Mark want to add. So you're saying there are abandoned buildings in the community you want to turn into affordable housing? Into a low-income co-op. Good. Do you want to speak? I, I think that probably Yolanda can complement, because Yolanda is the leader of that effort, a great leader it's, in our community. We just uh, another leader, uh, and the voice of many leaders here, yeah. uh, because Chorro Applause to Yolanda. So... I just want to say that uh, I hear you saying uh, what is to be done to, for affordable housing, and we also have another phase of that. This community from Hamilton Heights up to Inwood has a number of careless closed buildings that are not being given back to the community. The buildings are closed, the city owns some buildings, and they're selling the buildings to uh, people with deep package to, uh, or institutions that will renew these buildings. We are working for the affordable co-op in this community that guarantees the people working for the community in behalf of our own people. We grateful to your presence here. We think that we have the power in the community if we're given the opportunity to live in this community, to work for our own community in a lot of ways. Give us the opportunity to remain here, young generation here, I grew up here in affordable co-op because we think that if you own your own space, you will take care of your own space differently. So please, we, uh, we do have a number of buildings, a number of buildings that we're looking at, and we would like to have a meeting with you and your staff to digest this further and to present you our proposal on behalf of low-income co-op for this community. Thank you. Yolanda. Yol Wait, Yolanda's not finished. Hold on. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, nosotros creemos que un frente es preservar las viviendas como inquilinos, pero otro frente más interesante para nosotros es el número de edificios descuidados y abandonados que hay en esta comunidad siendo vendidos a grandes corporaciones o instituciones con dinero, a instituciones que están apretándonos como como un emparedado, como un sándwich aquí, porque están cogiendo de arriba y abajo los edificios que están abandonados. Creemos que el alcalde y sus, uh, su equipo competente de vivienda debía de pensar también en cooperativas, porque las cooperativas aseguran la permanencia de esta comunidad en esta comunidad y también dignifican las personas, pero cuando tú tienes un lugar propio tuyo, lo cuida y lo mira y lo ama de manera diferente. Por favor. He's good. Again, Yolanda is addressing something. First of all, she is a leader. And she been working in her building for decades. So she's talking about a mess that you inherit your administration. When there was many Till building that unfortunately we led them to fail. I know that there's a new vision that you have right now. So while Yolanda is putting the comments in a positive context, which is they have a role model. I have visited their building. They've been running a great financial responsibility. All the tenants, they are very committed, responsible. What she's saying is, as they did it in their building, they're looking to reproduce that role model working with you. But this is about a mess that you inherit, okay? 
¿verdad? Estamos hablando de algo que se heredaron de las administraciones pasadas, muchos edificios TIL que se dejaron eh, eh, fracasar. Tenemos en, en, el, en Arden también, Yolanda está compartiendo un modelo que ellos tienen en su edificio y que ellos quieren que la administración lo escuchen, lo vean, para ver cómo se puede reproducir. So, Yolanda, I appreciate your heart and your passion for the cause. And anyone, any leader who says, no, I'm not a leader, I'm just a voice of the people, is someone who I have the deepest respect for. So thank you. In terms of the work, so one of the things we do at these gatherings is we bring the experts and the people who are in a position to make something happen. Our commissioner for housing, preservation and development, HPD, Vicky Bean, our president of the Economic Development Corporation, Maria Torres Springer, who is very involved with the community on the Inwood Neighborhood Plan. I just want each of them to say a few words to you about how they will follow up with you on your vision. Terrific, and thank you so much, Yolanda, for that, uh, for that comment and for the passion. So I'm delighted to meet with you about any of these buildings. We did inherit a mess. We have tried very hard over the last uh, year and a half to start getting these buildings, the, till, the old till buildings, into repair, rehabbed. I think we, we've started a new program that you're probably familiar with, the Affordable Neighborhood Co-op Program. I think we've started three the rehabs on three of the buildings in Inwood. Um, over the past few months, and we're going to be doing many more. So, delighted to meet with you. We'll work it out, and uh, we are firmly committed to co-op ownership in this neighborhood and every. Absolutely, absolutely. All right. Um, Yolanda, let me also just add my own thanks and gratitude for your leadership and for your comments. So at the Economic Development Corporation, we've been working with many of you in this room on the Inwood Neighborhood Plan. Um, and that really, at its core, is a plan that we want to make sure creates opportunity for the people, for the businesses, for the local community groups in this neighborhood. Um, and so I would love to talk about ideas and models that you have so that it's something that we can learn from as we continue to work with a council member um, and everyone in this room to advance that plan, which um, at the end of the day, if it doesn't benefit the, the, the people who are in this room and your neighbors, um, we will not have done our job. So very much looking forward to that discussion. General. First, I'd like to uh, say thank you to Mayor de Blasio and all the representatives from the state and the city level. Um, my name is Carlton, and I took part in the third party transfer program. And I'd like the mayor to know that they really need to take a look at the third party transfer program because in my case, it's a failing program. Uh, the building is left with tremendous debt, shoddy work, uh, no reserves, or the reserves are not sufficient to help carry the debt to service. So it's happening all across the city. I've met with several buildings who are suffering the same symptoms that our building is suffering. And I think that they should reconsider this third party transfer program. I think that they should listen to the folks who live in these buildings because we have some ideas that might work. Because as it is right now, it's not working, Mayor de Blasio. And if, if, if you could afford us the time to meet with us so that we can discuss this further because there are so many things that have taken place with regards to the lack of oversight, the flip tax is too high. Okay, uh, let me, let me, I'm gonna call up Vicki Bean uh, and let me say this as I pass to Vicki. So part of, remember our affordable housing plan is 200,000 units built or preserved over 10 years. It's 120,000 preserved, 80,000 built. That is enough for almost half a million people in terms of total housing, how many people will reach. But the preservation piece literally looks at each and every building where we have a chance to stabilize finances and create a long-term plan. In fact, when I gave my State of the City speech at the beginning of the year, the woman who introduced me, Cheryl Morse, was in a building in Fort Greene, Brooklyn, 
that had been a low-income co-op for 40 years and was on the verge of financial collapse. And what Vicky Bean and our team did was we came in, we stabilized the finances of that building, and now they have a long-term, they'll be for decades, low-income housing for those families. So we know a lot of uh, the affordable housing in this city was left in a very precarious situation. But in many cases, not all, I want to be honest, but in many cases, we can stabilize as part of our preservation vision. I'll let Vicky explain a little more. Yes, and so I'm delighted to, um, again, meet with you and to hear your experiences. We have had troubles in the past with some of the third-party transfer um, buildings. Uh, the third-party transfer was where we took buildings that were in the hands of a bad landlord. We transferred them over to the tenants or for co-op ownership. Um, sometimes there weren't sufficient reserves. We're finding that from the past, and we're trying to correct those. But as the mayor said, we're delighted to work with you to think through some of the options. We've got a lot of options for energy efficiency, other things to bring down the costs. So let me give you my card, and, um, and we will be uh, delighted to talk with you. Thank you, Thank you Carlton. Okay, we've lost our moderator, but it's going to be a great meeting anyway. <laughs> Idonis Rodriguez, where are you? I'm here, Richard Espinal. Okay. Uh, we've already heard some very important points about affordability and legal representation. One of the things that uh, we need to see um, is one, greater response by HPD in terms of getting repairs in a lot of our buildings. People over and over again make complaints, make complaints, make complaints, but we don't have the resources to get those repairs done and we especially don't have the res tenants don't have the resources to take those landlords to court to get those repairs done. And one of the things that I think the city, we need to see from the city is support of tenants, especially when you have landlords who have violation after violation after violation and have the city's legal support so that they can represent all of the tenants in the building to get those repairs done and get all the things that they need done um, in those buildings. Because right now, one by one, one person trying to take them to court, it's just not happening and buildings are falling into disrepair. So let me, Vicky, you're busy tonight. Come on up let me first say, um, okay, first of all, uh, we believe in putting all sorts of kinds of pressure on landlords who leave their building in disrepair. And when I was public advocate long ago, well, Tish James was there, she's gone now, we started the Worst Landlords Watch List as a way of putting pressure on landlords, working with HPD, but also using public pressure to get landlords to make repairs. In many cases, that combination of the law and the enforcement by HPD plus the public pressure made a big impact. So it's something that public advocate Tish James has continued. We're working very closely with her. So one of the things I'll do is, obviously I want uh, Vicky to talk to you about some of the specifics, but I'm also gonna use this as an accountability moment for our administration. And our accountability judge will be council member Idanis Rodriguez. It, we should, in, in the case of this type of problem, um, get from you sort of a scorecard of which buildings are being addressed and which ones are not to hold us accountable to follow up. Now. If uh, a landlord is not making a repair, uh, and Vicky will talk about the exact approach, but we go in and we use our enforcement power to get to make repair. If they don't, and if it's a dangerous situation, a health or safety situation, we have the ability to do it ourselves, uh, and then make the landlord pay thereafter. You obviously are saying you have to see it happen consistently and it hasn't happened consistently enough. So let, let me have Vicky explain to you sort of how we're trying to improve that situation. Right, so we do, when repairs aren't being made, we will go in and make the repairs ourselves and then bill the landlord and, and it becomes a tax lien so that we could foreclose on the property, move it into better ownership. We also are in housing court all the time with tenants attorneys, with tenants advocates, bringing these more systematic cases of the kind that you were talking about. We also sometimes put buildings, problem buildings, into our you know, alternative enforcement program where we put a lot of attention on making sure that those repairs are, are getting made. But if you're not seeing that, then you know, let's talk about the particular buildings and we'll be sure that um, you know, they get a second look, okay? Thank you. Let me just take a moment, uh, Idanis and I realize that we have this all-star team of city officials and we had not yet introduced them. Excuse us, all-star team. So. Let me uh, just let you know, and I, I want to just surprise our many commissioners here by saying one of the great things about town hall meetings is that people can come up to you and talk to you at the end. So, 
to everyone in the audience, I'm going to tell you everyone who's here. Some of them will participate in answering questions, but if you also want to see them at the end, they will be available. So you already met our Housing Commissioner, Vicky Bean, and our Economic Development uh, Corporation President, Maria Torres Springer. Uh, first, I'll do this by rank, Deputy Mayor Richard Bury, who runs our pre-K initiative, our mental health initiatives, and so many other things. You have to stand when I say your name. And now, I'm just going to run through them, and you'll, I want to make sure you know who everyone is, and everyone please stand when I say your name. Uh, the person who actually runs all those legal aid programs that we're talking about as the Commissioner for HRA, Commissioner Steve Banks. The Executive Director for the City Planning Commission, Purnima Kapoor. The, the Commissioner for Homeless Services, Gil Taylor. The Chair of the New York City Housing Authority, I'm the only person who can say her name right, Shola Olatoye. Our Commissioner of Health, Mary Bassett, Dr. Mary Bassett. Our Commissioner of Sanitation, Catherine Garcia. Someone who many of you know, the Chief for Manhattan North, the NYPD, Chief Kapool. Thank you very much for being here. You have a fan club? Our Parks Commissioner, Mitch Silver. My counsel and the woman who also runs all of our MWB and diversity efforts, Maya Wiley. Deputy Chancellor of the Department of Education, Dorita Gibson. Our Buildings Commissioner, Rick Chandler. Our Community Affairs Commissioner, Marco Carrion. Our Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the woman who brought us the City ID card that now over half a million New Yorkers have, Nisha Argawal. The woman who makes sure all the potholes are filled, Commissioner Polly Trottenberg of DOT. There, that's a positive introduction. Man who's working to make sure that our small businesses are treated fairly and are not fined the way they used to be fined, our Small Business Services Deputy Commissioner Greg Bishop. And also working very hard to make sure small businesses are not fined unfairly, and her agency's done a great job reducing those fines, are Consumer Affairs Commissioner Julie Menon. And a woman who has one of the most complicated jobs in government anyway, the T anywhere in the world, the TLC Commissioner, Taxi and Limousine Commissioner Mira Joshi. All right, let's go back to our program. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Fenyoski Peña Mora's here. Hold on, hold on. Department of Design and Construction Commissioner Fenyoski Peña Mora. And I see Lizette Camillo too, the, the, the director of the Mayor's Office of Contracts. This is the person you want to know, the person who gives out the contracts, Lizette Camillo. Did I miss anyone? Any other commissioners? Did I miss a commissioner? Okay, thank you. So we continue? Yes. Great. Senora. Oh. Buenas noches. Eh, yo he venido aquí porque yo tengo un problema a donde vivo de un señor que se mudó en hace cuatro años. Desde que se mudó ahí, toda, de todos esos tiempos que, te, que tiene ahí, no me deja dormir todas las noches tirando objetos pesados arrastrando muebles, yo tengo que levantarme de mi cama ahí a sentarme a la cocina. Y no es justo, porque yo quiero saber cuáles son mis derechos. Yo soy ciudadana, vine aquí legal y yo me estoy sintiendo pisoteada porque el supe es el primero que estás en contra mía y a favor de que vive arriba en el tercer piso. Él dice que no es él que hace el escándalo, que son lo de la, de la barbería afuera en la esquina, tapándolo a él. Entonces, pasa lo siguiente. Thank you. Gracias, doña. Let me, uh, this is, so as many of you understood, uh, 
She believes she's being treated unfairly by another tenant in her building, and it's a profound quality of life problem for her. So uh, I think this one's a little complicated. I want Chief Kapoor to come up in terms of how we deal with a noise issue like that, because he's that good. And Vicky, I don't know if you have something to add. Don't worry, Chief, you can handle this one. No. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, listen, we, when you have a problem with your tenant, obviously one of the things we, we'd like to do is uh, each person has a community affairs staff. Uh, we'd like to set up a meeting with the community affairs staff. Uh, if it's something that, that we can resolve, be great. If not, there's some mediation centers within the uh, community that we will try and have you sit down with the two parties and resolve your problem. Uh, but what you'll do is after the precinct, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, if the, where do you live exactly? Okay, you're, you're in the uh, 34th precinct, and I will make sure that the uh, 34th precinct representatives of community affairs staff come and meet with you and, and uh, address your concerns. Well done. Thank you. Come on, this is one of the most important religion leader in our community. He is a person in charge of Santa Elizabeth Church, a 187 in St. Nick, who also advocates a lot for tenants also in his church, Padre Amioris. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Danis Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor, for coming. Uh, my question is not made up. It's not made up. It's a real story. As I was coming here just two hours before, uh, it's a mother, and this is the big concern. Um, housing is a big concern for me, our community, our church. But this is a mother uh, living in a very difficult condition with her daughter, seven years old, uh, on a living room, on a mattress. And when she tells me the whole story regarding, you know, getting up at 4 o'clock to do bringing some uh, money, um, to pay the end meets um, for a child. But you could see the physical, emotional stress on this mother. And when she tells me the whole story, to make the story short, is, and I, I, I'm thinking, you know, this mother and this seven years old daughter needs to get out of this situation, I mean, almost immediately. Uh, she's physically sick. Uh, the daughter is also physically sick, not only that, she tells me the daughter has to wait until midnight to go to bed because uh, she lives on, on, on a sofa bed, on the living room, two teenagers, you know, it's part of the family, but the point is she has nowhere to go to pay even a room, less an apartment. And my question to me, and of course, uh, was... Where do I turn? Where do I go? I mean, this woman and this child, because she tells me the child is even falling asleep in class because uh, she goes to bed. She has to wait. I mean, she has to wait for midnight for everybody to go to sleep, but she has no way to go. And I asked, you know, about family members or, any, or anybody else. So my question, I said, where do I get an apartment? Where did I get even a room, as you know, how expensive there are for this woman and this child that almost immediately need to get out. And the question is, you know, right. because of the expense uh, that we are leaving. So this is one case, I'm sure, of many others yes. that are pushing people, you know, away from our community because of living conditions and the expense of apartments and rooms. Thank you very much, Father. Thank you for all you do for the community, too. I'm going to ask in a moment our HRA Commissioner Steve Banks may have a couple of ideas about ways we can help this particular family, but let me just speak to the bigger situation we're facing. We know we have an affordable housing crisis. It's a profound crisis. The plan I'm talking about will literally house half a million people, and there'll still be more people who need help. But this is what we know we can do. This is what we know we can contribute to change things. But the other thing that we have to do is what we talked about before. Stop people from being evicted who shouldn't be evicted. And protect people in the housing they have. Protect that affordable housing, because when people are evicted, it's no longer affordable, we lose it forever. But beyond that, for a family, what you describe is the crisis we're living through. The cost of housing goes up, and as I said, the wages and benefits have been flat, so families are just squeezed in so many directions. And you're exactly right, it has a horrible impact on children. 
in so many ways. And so what we're trying to do is fix what's broken. So for example, trying to do everything we can to raise wages and benefits for people so they have some chance of actually getting housing they could afford. One of the things we did, for example, last year was trying to add benefits that people don't have now. A million more people got paid sick leave benefits last year who didn't have them in the past. That means they don't lose money from their wages when they're sick or when a family member's sick. One of the things we've tried to do on top of that is just lighten the burdens on families with the cost of living in so many other ways. I'm very, very proud of what we've done with after-school programs. Now every middle school kid has free after-school in this city if they want it. Every single middle school child qualifies. But also our pre-K program, which is something that if a parent had to pay for it, they would be paying $10,000 or more to have a child in some kind of private pre-K or nonprofit pre-K, but we're giving it to people for free. All of this is to try to lighten the burden on working families who are struggling. Still not enough, there's still more we have to do. And there's bigger changes we need in Albany and in Washington if we're actually going to serve working people better. There's no question about it. The city can do a lot, but we can't do everything we should be able to do for working people without the help of both Albany and Washington. We're fighting to make those changes too. But all I can say to you is, Every day we're trying to increase the ability of families to get by in this city. We're trying to give them more options for affordable housing and restore a sense in this community that people actually, that working people can actually survive in New York City. Because for years that idea was coming into losing, we were losing it more and more all the time. It was slipping away. And we're trying to restore the idea that that's what New York City has to be, a place for working people, a place for every kind of people. I want Steve to talk to you about some of the things we might be able to do to help this family. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you very much for the work that you do in the community. Um, I certainly am aware of it from when I used to run the Legal Aid Society before I became the HRA Commissioner. There are some HRA staff here right behind you. We want to really try to see what we can do for this particular family. And in addition to looking at this particular family's needs, a partnership with you as you reach out to other members of the community that have similar situations, we will try to see what we can do. Uh, there are many people in this situation. It's, it's a situation that the administration inherited, and the mayor's policies, as he described, are really aimed at addressing the root causes. But in the meantime, there are families and children that are suffering, and we want to do everything we can. And so we'll follow up with you right after this. Right behind you, you'll see some staff from HRA. Thank you. Thanks. Buenas noches. Mi Buenas nombre noches. es Marta Beato. Encantada. Eh, fui una líder comunitaria de Washington High. Esta escuela, los padres, nosotros salimos a Albany para que esta escuela esté aquí. Mi nombre, eh, vuelvo y les repito, Marta Beato, Community Education Council, Madame Sherman, 2000, year 2000. The reason that I'm here is because a lot of problems is happening in the community. And you have a lot of people to work for, for your staff. But then when you go to the places where you need help, they don't help you. Because right now, I'm going to be a victim. Tomorrow I have to go to court. And I'm glad the commissioner is here because I sent many letters that I'm asking for help. I have a fire in my apartment since October last year. I had three children. Right now, I'm not working. I'm a professional too. I want to put a daycare in my house. I went to Idani's office. He said, any help? The Department of Health giving me a lot of hard time. And what they told me in HRA, what they told me everywhere, you Latino people come here to this country to ask for help when you're supposed to go back to your country. I make a letter, and I have a proof of that letter, to the commission of HRA, and nobody resolved my problem. Right now, welfare deny you to help me out. I was 20 years volunteer in this community as a PTA president, empowered parents, Telling people who is the principal is not doing things for the school. And I never was afraid. I was with Robert Jackson doing lovey time. Fighting for the community. Now I need help. They told me, go educate. I educate myself. I went to college. And now I'm going to do my master. And they deny you the help because the paper didn't come on time. So I've been doing the best I can to go on in my life. Because right now, the community is growing, but it's growing for people from downtown. All the people from downtown. And my building is made, I had 25 years 
my building. And they bring the, the College for Community University to be as a, as a dorm uh, 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 apartment. My land is giving me $10,000 after 25 years. I have 55 violations and I cannot even put my daycare. Okay, let me tell you, first of all, thank you. Thank you for all you have done for the community, and certainly someone who's done so much for the community should be treated better. The comment you said that you heard or was written to you is absolutely unacceptable. Uh, this is a city of immigrants. Uh, anybody who is a New Yorker and speaks against immigrants obviously doesn't know their own family history, right? Because this is a city of immigrants. And I, I want to answer your question, but I have to give a personal comment. I was with my aunt, who's 95 years old. And her name's Yola, and she grew up here in the city. And she told me that when she was growing up, Italians were often taunted and bullied and called names that we don't allow anymore. And I said to her, now this is almost literally 90 years ago or 80 years ago, she's telling stories about back then, and I said, what did you do? And she said, my father said to me to always remember to be proud. And she said, that's what sustained her. Now, I say that as a proud Italian-American because whether you're a Dominican-American, Italian-American, any background, we have all been through discrimination. We've all been treated like we don't belong, which is un-American, because there would be no America without all of us. Let's face it, we made America what it is. So, I just want to say, any person who calls themselves a public servant and says people should go back to the country they came from does not belong in public service in New York City. And I apologize that anyone would say such a thing to you. In terms of how we can help, uh, we have obviously the HRA Commissioner right here, and Steve will spend time with you after to see what we can do to help um, if someone's offering you a buyout, you heard me say it, beware, unless the buyout actually works for you, uh, a lot of times it's a trap and it's a setup. And so we will make sure that you have the legal assistance to know your rights and to make your own decision and any other way that we can help. And our health commissioner, Dr. Mary Bass, is here. Uh, she'll make sure that the health department speaks to you about your idea about uh, having a daycare center. So I, I really appreciate all that you've done, and let's see if we can get things on a better track for you. Let's hear from Mino Lora, who's been using the theory also to educate our tenants. So, uh, there we go, right there. Constantly... Gracias, thank you. <laughs> um, one thing that's a, a big issue that we've seen in our community and the stories that keep coming that we're trying to educate our community, but I would love to know what your administration is doing about, is we have long-term tenants who have lived there uh, 20, 30, 40 years, pero they're not on the lease. Mm. But they have bills that say they've been on the lease. But maybe it's the grandfather's one, the grandfather's apartment, or maybe it's the primo that was there, but then they left. And they, I mean, it's their, it's their apartment. They've raised their kids there, they've changed the floors, right? They've changed the floors of the place, but yet they're not on the lease. And we know the tenants have rights, but is, how can we find a way to transfer the lease? Like, no, this person has been living here for 34 years, they deserve the same rights. How can we give them those rights in paper so that we don't risk and live in fear that we'll be evicted? So. I'm going to turn to Steve, and Steve, you can start, and Vicky, if you want to add the... Um, it's the same point. I appreciate the point very much, because we're talking about the people who made a community great and protecting their interests. Now, we live within the laws, always, and that's something we have to figure out how to best serve someone within the existing law. But what you're calling for is what we believe in, protecting people who are of the community and built the community. Uh, has a guy who uh, epitomized uh, legal aid for many years. I think he can tell us honestly what can be done and some of the things that can't be done in that situation. Steve, why don't you? 
I, I well understand your situation. I represented many tenants in the kind of situation that you're describing. Uh, they're difficult cases to win, but they can be won under certain circumstances. And with the support that the mayor is providing for legal services programs, North Manhattan Improvement Corporation here, Legal Services NYC, Legal Aid, and other programs around the city, we're able to take more of those cases now than we used to be able to have people get that kind of help. Obviously, it's a state law change that would be needed to make this easier. But we don't want to just say, oh, it's a state law uh, change. We're able to provide lawyers in situations like that to see whether we can win. There are a number of different ways you could prove you're actually there, that the landlord knew you were there. You've heard all these arguments before. Um, it, they don't always win, but we have resources to look at cases and see whether or not we can help. Again, it's, it's part of the state landlord-tenant law, but that's not enough to say, hey, it's a state problem. We're taking the bull by the horns here, and the mayor's funding additional legal assistance to the tune of 10 times as much as there used to be available. And we can look at these kind of cases and see if we can help. I think there's two, two answers. One, and I know the state representatives here that are very sympathetic, your senator and your assembly members are very pro-tenant, and I would urge you to have the conversation with them about what possibilities there are for making those state law changes. But Steve's point, in the here and now with the legal aid services we have, we should try in each case to see if we can get something done for the tenants. It's worth trying. And so if you know of cases, they can come to us directly or through 311 or through a council member. And in some cases, I mean, he's, he's the expert. Sometimes it's possible to win. Great. Thank you. Pino. My pleasure. Uh, Never I forgot when you come to my home in 1991. You remember? My little I, kid. I was young then. Yeah, yeah I know, I know. <laughs> you coming with uh, your best friend, uh, Ralph Andrew. I remember that. Yeah, do you, you and Ralph Andrew was in my home. Mr. Mayo, I have uh, two questions. You know, I have uh, three, three, uh, diff uh, di three different areas. A three building in your administration, they passed, they was in, in Teos, uh, they passed to, to Manhattan Valley. Manhattan Valley is the company, it has a lot of buildings in this neighborhood, a lot. A lot of people in danger because Manhattan Valley increased the rent. This year, it's better for us because the state start to increase the, the, the rent in this year. One year and two years, only two years, two percent. Okay, for the building, 457 West, 166 between Amsterdam Avenue and Econ, the, the, the tenants lost the, the building. Now, Manhattan Valley got this building. Uh, 21, 25, and Amsterdam Avenue too. And uh, 29, 2095 in Antelan Avenue 2. They, this building, this building now is in control of the Manhattan Valley. I don't know why, because I listened before. Somebody say, and your administration doesn't happen. But I have it, I have it that the name, uh, Deborah Bosaco, say HPD, and Adri Myers. This is the, the manager, that's building. Okay, I don't know why they passed. Let's another get question, you. Another question is my, my personal question to you. I want to do it in public. You know why? Because always respect to you. Always close to you. For any decision you take it, for any position, I give you my support to you. And my family, we have some questions. My wife and my kids, they're not coming to, to the meeting because they don't feel unhappy. When you was over, there, over here, uh, about you talk about that. Uh, my country, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic, Dominican Republic, it don't do nothing for Haiti country. We believe, we believe. Excuse me. Okay, wait a sec. Let's, we'll finish, we'll finish. Hold on, let him. Now we'll finish, we'll finish. That's all. That's let what I want. Only what I want, listen to him. Because I know him for a long, long time. Yeah. I want... Because he don't, he don't give you to us apologize. Yeah, I want to know why he don't do it. What reason he got to don't, don't, give, don't give you to us Sure. Apologize. Okay. So let's, you had two questions, and we'll speak to both of them. 
Let's do the Manhattan Valley first. You wanted to frame it for everyone? First, it, first of all, like, it, HPD and Vicky, they will follow to see what have happened in that building. She will follow with you after the meeting is over. This meeting today, the mayor said whatever he had to say on all the issue. This issue today is about tenants' rights. Ginny. I'm very glad that you're here and thank you. As a person who has been fighting for the RGB for more than 20 years, I can't even remember how many times we've been there, I really, really appreciate what happened this year. This was a great victory. But let's recognize, <laughs> Mayor de Blasio, that it was the tenants who were fighting for that for years and years and years. And we have to recognize that the tenants fought for this. Mayor de Blasio made it possible, but without the fight of the tenants, this would not have happened. So that's number one, uh, just a comment. But what I wanted to, to bring up is, and I'm with Rena, and I'm, we're, we're with, connected with the R3 and with Med Council and various tenant groups in the city. We are very worried about this neighborhood. We see the gentrification that's going on now. We see that people are being pushed out of their homes. Now, I know you spoke to that partially. However, what we're really worried about, I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, is your inclusionary zoning. The, this, is, this plan, as, and I've read about it, is going to bring a huge number of market rate tenants into this neighborhood. We know what happens when market rent tenants come into a neighborhood. The stores are being closed already now. 162nd Street, I'm sure you know, on Broadway, an entire block of small businesses was pushed out. They, the landlord refused to renew their leases because they know that bigger stuff is coming soon. We all know that there's stores that are closed, bigger things are coming soon. Columbia Presbyterian, all kinds of uh, private businesses, private real estate, is building buildings. And this is not right. Now, I know that I understand that you want to do the best thing and you want to build affordable housing. But I'm very, not just me, a lot of us are very worried about your plan. We need to have affordable housing. We don't need market rate tenants who can pay market rent, can pay market rent. They don't have a problem. It's the people who cannot pay rock market rent who have the problem. And the person who raised, I think that Esteban before raised, I wanna re reiterate that. The plan that you have, unfortunately, with the 80-20 or the 60-40 and the AMI for people earning 80,000, I, I feel bad for people earning 80,000. They're not rich people. They also can't afford. However, our neighborhood, I think our uh, mean income now is like 35,000 for a family. That's where we need to worry, and I would wish that you would change your plan. So, because it's a democracy, I will, I will give you a lot of respect, and then I will challenge your assumptions. The uh, respect is especially because you're exactly right. The only way we got to changes on many things is because there were grassroots movements, there were people speaking up. I believe this, I believe that's how change is made in the world, that's how social change is made. When we passed uh, paid sick leave, it was after years of an effort to achieve it, long before there was ever a vote. And I think you're right, tenants have demanded uh, more fairness from the Rent Guidelines Board for years. And I'm glad that we could be the ones to bring it, but you're right, a tenant movement help sustain that demand. Certainly, tenants did extraordinary things in Albany to achieve real change this last year and previously. So, we start with the same assumption. Now, why I need to challenge you, and I laid this out in my uh, State of the City speech, but I have to say it again. There, are, you could argue there's two different ways to go. Leave things as they are, which I can say as someone from Brooklyn, we've seen what happens when you leave things when they are. And I want to say, because really this is the history of the last 20 years. In a lot of neighborhoods, Bushwick, Brooklyn is a classic example. There was no policy, there was no government intervention, there was no public approach, and the market fundamentally changed the reality of Bushwick and people were forced out. Government just held its hands up and didn't do a thing. My worldview is that's unacceptable. 
and that the government has to be involved to maximize the rights of people. Now, you could say, well, can't you just build affordable housing? Economically, the answer is no, and I don't want to lie to people about that. We can do a lot, but the 200,000 units, enough for half a million people, is based on, in some cases, it's pure public money, but in a lot of cases, it's also using those rezonings and the other uh, market rate housing to fund the affordable housing. That's the reality in our economic world we're living in. I believe that. I could do affordable housing only, but I'd be doing a lot less. So I'm arguing to you, and I'm not expecting you to agree with me tonight, but I just want you to at least hear my worldview because I certainly hear yours. I'm arguing to you that by us saying, okay, we're going to put ground rules on this whole process. We know development's going to happen. It has been happening all over New York City. We are in some ways victims of our own success. People from all over the world want to be here. It is shooting up the price of housing. It's putting development pressure on all sorts of neighborhoods, including neighborhoods you never would have believed would have experienced development pressure, but that's reality. Doing nothing is not an option. So now when you say, what could something look like? My view is the government comes in and says, there are ground rules. There's mandatory inclusionary zoning and other rules that force the maximum amount of affordable housing. We include in the equation other things the community needs, whether it's open space, whether it's schools or other amenities for the community. We maximize hiring and training of community residents. We get affordable housing, new affordable housing in the bargain that we would not be able to afford otherwise. And you could say, well, wait a minute, what does that do for people in their existing housing? Which is a perfectly fair question. That's why 120,000 units citywide are preserved. They're financed and preserved through the plan and $60 million of legal services to stop harassment and illegal evictions. So all of that is, uh, it's not perfect, but it's a coordinated strategy to say, if you stop people from being evicted, who shouldn't be evicted? If you keep people in their buildings who can be kept in their buildings with the right subsidies and the right kind of uh, preservation effort. And you build new affordable housing on top of that. That is the best response we can mount to what is a bigger organic challenge. It will not be perfect, but we think it will preserve affordability for thousands and thousands of people in each neighborhood and help us keep neighborhoods the way they are. That's what we're fighting for. Great. And Jeannie, you will continue being sitting at a table because your voice is very important. So thank you also for your leadership on behalf of the tenants. So we know that you, we will be sitting together. Ms. Yvonne Stennett. Thank you. So this has nothing to do with housing, but uh, I just want to show you my New York City ID. I want to tell you, it's working. <laughs> you got one too? <laughs> He's got one too. <laughs> um, as one of the major of providers of affordable housing in Washington Heights, I'm very happy to hear about the preservation of the existing affordable housing. And I think we have to be very creative about how we package that financially so that it is uh, affordable for a long period of time. As you know, a lot of the tax credits, year 15 deals, have reached their mecca, and now we have to really figure out how do we continue doing that, but also how do we infuse some new capital in them because they need a lot of improvement. So I, I hope we focus on that and be able to preserve our, our existing affordable housing. Let me have uh, Vicky speak to that, but the, uh, I just have to first say, since you started with the idea, I'm just gonna spend a moment and say the other night I was in a restaurant and I ordered a beer and the uh, waitress asked for my ID. It was the high point of my week. So <laughs> that's why I associate with this ID, Vicki Bean. So we thank you and thank you for all you've done for affordable housing throughout the city. But um, we are very focused on preservation of those year 15 deals, other deals. We're infusing enormous amounts of capital into trying to preserve them, extend the affordability. We're rolling out new programs, for example, using energy investments to lower costs to try to keep them uh, affordable for a longer period of time. So happy to talk with you about any of the buildings that you're concerned about. Yeah, and let me just add to that. Thank you, Vicki. Let me, let me add two points. One, again, you know, I know everyone will take full advantage of the presence of these leaders of all the key agencies tonight. And certainly one of the things we intend with these meetings is that they be the kind of follow-up meetings we need on a lot of these topics. So please, you know, if there's a specific thing, especially you're trying to achieve, make that appointment so we can follow up. But the second thing is, and it gets to the previous point as well, 
We look at the previous administration, and I say this with respect for them, they had a very substantial affordable housing plan. We doubled the amount of capital investment proportionally. We doubled the amount of capital investment for affordable housing. And we said, it's going to be 200,000 units, it's going to be enough for half a million people in the next 10 years. Hold us accountable. I want to give Vicki Bean a lot of credit and a lot of the other folks here because the first year, the first year they were measured was this first uh, fiscal, full fiscal year ended on June 30. They produced uh, and financed over 20,000 units are in production now. 20,000 units in the first year of a plan that has to get to 200,000. So the, the investment of a huge amount of capital dollars is having an impact. And uh, I, what I think is, I see this at HPD and other agencies, there's an entrepreneurial spirit of looking for every place that we can to either build more affordable housing or preserve existing housing, and we need good partners to do it. And we certainly look forward to partnering with you. Great. And before taking the question of, you know, the voice of the youth in our, com in our community, I want to recognize a great leader also in our community, in our city, Dr. Rafael Antigua also, that he's being that he has been with us too. How you doing, Mr. Mayor? Uh, I feel like I'm a lot younger than most of the people that voice their concerns and issues. Everybody has a valid point. But coming from a, a younger person, I just want to know, um, are they, other than shelters, are there any alternative affordable housing programs for young men with, with kids or no kids or single? so that we can find apartments as well, other than going through the shelter route? Um. Well, the shelter route, you know, and again, I'll let our commissioners uh, speak to this, but the, we, we, we hope that people never have to go to a, hose, a homeless shelter, let's face it. The goal is to stop that from ever being the result for a family. So what we're trying to do more and more, and uh, Commissioner Gil Taylor can talk about it, and Steve Banks on top of Vicki Bean, they can all talk about it. We're trying to help families, first of all, if there's any chance that they may be evicted, to stay in the apartments they have, either with legal services or with rental subsidies. And there's lots of people we can help that way, and that's been one of the reasons that we've been able to slow down the number of people going into the shelter and help a lot of people back out of shelter into permanent housing. But the goal is that you never have to consider a homeless shelter. That's why the affordable housing plan is as big as it is, enough for a half a million people. It's not all here now. I'm not going to lie to you. It's not all here now. We'll take that full 10 years to build it all out. But every year there will be more and more for people to tap into. And the other part of the equation I mentioned earlier, we have to raise wages and benefits so that people actually have some chance of reaching the housing that is available. We're working here at the city level. That's why we did the paid sick leave law. That's why we have an executive order in terms of living wage for a lot of jobs in the city. But we need much more help to raise wages and benefits, which is why we need Albany to act on a $15 minimum wage. We need the Congress to act on a $15 minimum wage. And I'll be happy, whichever one gets there first, but we need to raise wages to a level that people can actually afford to live on. And that's, that's part of the bigger solution. Vicki and then either Gil or Steve, you want to talk about what we can do right now for people. So let me talk about how to find housing for, you know, so that you don't have to go into a shelter. But so one of the things that everybody should do is go on to housingconnect.org to enter the lottery, which is how we distribute the affordable housing that we are building and financing. So everybody should do that. We have several new um, uh, apartment buildings that have been designed for younger folks, especially younger folks coming out of foster care, often with younger children. So we have, uh, we're doing a lot of those new buildings and we're gonna be doing more. So be sure and sign up for Housing Connect so that you're in those lotteries and, and, could, uh, and could move into those as well. But let me turn to Steve for. Thank you. Um, in terms of your individual circumstance, uh, we have a table that's here tonight, a home-based table. It's a special program that's run by the Department of Homeless Services that's trying to do everything we possibly can to not have you say, gee, the only choice I have is going into the shelter. And there are some new tools that the mayor has given us to try to help people in a situation like yours. So please uh, uh, go to the home-based table and we'll also follow up with you right afterwards. Please don't leave. Let's continue going around, then we can come back here. Por aquí. Hi, Mayor, thank you for joining us this evening. Deborah Lee Santos from the Manhattan Times, your local paper up here. 
Um, we've had the vantage point for 20 years of observing the neighborhood um, from what would hope would be an involved but yet dispassionate point of view. And everyone's concerns here are being heard in both languages. Um, I think the broader issue is that you've got a city that's changing dramatically. And Washington Heights and Inwood in northern Manhattan has always been, in some ways, the litmus, the, the sort of the canvas for the rest of the city. We've absorbed all the changes, we are the change, and yet we're absorbing changes in a way that are ostensibly, perhaps, causing detrimental uh, changes. Housing, small business. Um, and ultimately, I want you to talk about the fact that this is an immigrant community, and what your administration is doing specifically to address the immigrants in this room, which, as you said earlier, are all of us, and how you've expanded in your administration the response that's needed. And I speak specifically both to the Department of Education, because we're standing in a building that ostensibly was built by los inmigrantes que están aquí presente. This building was built by the immigrants you see here. So I'd like for you to talk about how the Department of Education specifically, and just more generally, your administration is speaking to those concerns. Thank you. Let me start with an overview of how we approach it real quickly, and I'll turn to Dorita Gibson. I'd also like Nisha Argawal to say a few words on this. So, our idea of respecting and uplifting a city of immigrants has a lot of different elements to it. Um, this is a city that I believe is an example to the world, and it means, for one thing, none of our city agencies discriminate against people because they're immigrants or because of their documentation status. That's something we're very scrupulous about. Uh, as you know, recently, we made changes working with the city council to change our relationship to the federal government when it came to the ICE detainers. Because we said, unless someone has committed a very serious crime, we respect the fact that our police department, all our agencies, must relate to all of our residents equally. And by the way, that's the only way we're all going to be safe if all our residents feel they can go to the police and other agencies and bring forward their needs and what they know and not fear deportation. So that's one example. What we've done with the municipal ID card, the municipal ID card has a lot of different impacts. Nisha will talk about it. One of the things is it, it first of all, respects people regardless of, the, of uh, documentation status. But second, it's very practical. You need a lease. You need a bank account. You need some possibility of living fully it's one of the things that facilitates it. What we've done to provide legal assistance, again, city council's been outstanding on legal assistance for those facing deportation. Something our federal government should do, but they don't. But the city of New York has stepped up through the support of the city council to actually help stop families from being divided. And what a horrible outcome on a human level. And let's remember who was with us just a couple of weeks ago. Pope Francis has been the most powerful voice in the world on this. How could any government divide parents from children? and consider that at all acceptable. But that's what our federal government is doing, and in this city, we do everything we can to stop that. So those are examples, but to your point about Department of Education and beyond, it has to pervade everything we do. We're truly embracing our immigrant heritage and the fact that it will define our future, it has to pervade everything we do. So Dorito will give you examples in terms of dual language, and other efforts, and then I'd like Nisha to say a few words. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for that. And this is a beautiful school, and you met the two principals that are associated with this. But I also want to recognize our two superintendents that are here, Superintendent Ramirez and Superintendent Conyers. We're very, very happy and very pleased with our District 6 schools, and looking at the data, you can see that the reading scores are inching its way up, as is the math, and we're working very hard with that. But we, we're building dual language programs here because we respect the, the families that are here. But not only that, we've, we were increasing our universal pre-K, and, and the mayor has spoken about that, and our community schools, because that is what this is about. I mean, this administration has done a lot for parents and a lot for communities, and you can't have a school run without in community involvement. And that's what we want to have happen here. We want to continue to grow that work. So, so we're here for you. The Department of Education is very proud of the work that we're doing. We want and hear, to hear from you. We want your participation to make this continue to grow in the right direction. And if every school in the city could look like this, we would be in a good place right now. Thank you so much for your comments. And you know, I'll just underscore some of the points that the mayor raised. First, with the municipal ID in this neighborhood, about 8% of the people have an ID card. So we're really close to one out of 10 people in this neighborhood having an ID. And as the mayor said, people are using it for 
getting into their child's school, to not just be able to pick up their kid from school, but participate in the PTA, run for elections in the school, sign leases, open bank accounts. And so that's a critical part. It's a, it's a card for all New Yorkers, but really inspired by the needs of immigrant communities. Recently, we announced uh, the recommendations of the Immigrant Health Task Force, including starting a project to provide better coordinated care for the undocumented. This is a direct result of the federal government not really being able to meet this need, so New York City is going to do what it can. Um, on top of that, doing a lot of work with the city council on immigrant legal services. We know that for immigrants, being able to get information about their legal status. Um, on top of that, doing a lot of work with the city council on immigrant legal services. We know that for immigrants, being able to get information about their legal status is critical. So whether it's deportation defense all the way to becoming a U.S. citizen, we've been supporting programs for New Yorkers across the city on doing that kind of work and very open in my office uh, to partnering with anybody on new ideas to really create the most inclusive city in, in the country. Thank you. I just want to add because we're talking about Department of Education. Now this is, there is a lot, there are a lot of challenges we're facing. We're talking about tough challenges tonight, what we're trying to do about them all together. But sometimes it's important to celebrate successes too. So I want to give you a real life success story uh, for Washington Heights and Inwood. In the office in the school year that ended June of 2014, uh, there were 394 kids in full day pre-K in this. Uh, the year I came into office in the school year that ended June of 2014, uh, there were 394 kids in full day pre-K in this community, 394 kids. By last year, it was 1,388 kids getting full day pre-K. And as they say at late night television, but wait, there's more. This year, in Washington Heights and Inwood, 1,628 kids enrolled in full day high quality pre-K. That makes a difference. And I also like to add that the New York Times recognized after the mayor presented his vision on education, his initiative on education, that his plan present a solution at the national level when it comes to education. So, so you know, like, Estamos hablando de que el propio periódico New York Times reconoce que el plan de educación que presentó el alcalde es un plan que presenta alternativa a nivel de la nación. And of course, as I said before, you need to pour your money where your work is. And then he also, for the else community, for the immigrant community, first time we have a deprey chancellor, Milady Weiss, who really, who had really money to do her job. So también tenemos eh, un reconocimiento a la comunidad de estudiantes else, los que vienen aprendiendo el inglés aquí, por primera vez nombran una deprey chancellor, Milady Weiss, con un presupuesto específico de cómo ayudar a los estudiantes que están aprendiendo el inglés también. So that's, that's, you know, that's, a, you know, that's how we can see the commitment to hope the immigrant uh, population and, and bringing someone like Manny Ramirez and other that come from a great experience or running like a good school. And also with the changes that the DOE have made, which is to allow the superintendents to make all the decisions that they had to make on the school that they are responsible for. So I know that this is going to be also, it will have a great impact on all the students, but especially in our Latino students. Por allá. Al medio. Eh, quería, queríamos aprovechar el encuentro de hoy para introducir una carta que fue preparada el mayo del año pasado eh, por la Coalición Comunitaria por una Vivienda como Derecho Humano. Es una carta pública que fue, diri estaba dirigida al medio y no fue posible entregarla por una serie de razones y queremos depositarla para que sea entregada a él. Básicamente sobre ella, que no la vamos a leer, nada más queríamos puntualizar dos o tres elementos. El primero es que eh, todos sabemos los grandes esfuerzos que hace la ciudad y diferentes eh, instancias del gobierno estatal y federal para asegurar eh, una vivienda eh, al alcance de las personas de bajos ingresos. En la práctica, todas estas políticas han fracasado. 
Muestra de ello es que cerca de eh, 300.000 familias son llevadas a corte todo, todos los años. De estas 300.000 familias, alrededor de 30.000 familias son desalojadas aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York. A pesar de todos estos programas y a pesar de que hay una gran cantidad de recursos financieros dirigidos a sostener eh, servicios legales para proteger a esta gente. El hecho es que todos esos servicios son importantes, pero eh, el medio ha señalado algunas de las razones que explican la causa de, de la crisis de afordabilidad, que es el problema de los bajos salarios, por un lado, el problema del de costo de la vida aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York requiere alrededor de 24 dólares el salario mínimo y apenas se pagan 8 dólares. Pero el problema principal que tiene que ver también con la Asamblea Estatal y, y, y el Senado Estatal reside en las leyes de renta de la ciudad de Nueva York. Esas leyes que se nos han vendido como un panacea y sobre la cual descansa la mayoría de las políticas de afordabilidad. El problema es, ya para concluir, que esa, eh, eh, la ley de renta de la ciudad de Nueva York, eh, el estatuto de renta, en vez de contribuir a retener los aumentos de renta, lo que ha hecho es decretar aumento permanente de la renta durante 50 años. El, eh, la renta estabilizada han subido entre 500 y 800 por ciento. Y le, lo que eran apartamentos de renta controlada desaparecieron prácticamente, gracias a esa ley. Okay. Yo gracias. Exporto... Déjalo, déjalo por ahí. Gracias. Cogimos el mensaje okay. muy bueno y en el punto. Okay? So, your, look, your point is very powerful. We've been falling behind. Again, as I say, cost of living has gone up, wages and benefits have not. It's not been working. We, as a city, are doing something very different. $60 million dollars to provide legal aid to people in need to stop evictions. That's different. That never happened in the past. Ten times as much money, ten times as much money for legal services than happened just a few years ago. A plan to create and to preserve 200,000 units of affordable housing, enough for a half a million people. These are big changes, but still we need more. I agree with you. And again, your representatives in Albany are fighting, but we need more from Albany. We need stronger rent regulation. We made some progress in this last session, but we need even more. We need rent regulation that actually will protect affordable housing for the long term. And we need a $15 minimum wage. Because you're right, you're not going to be able, people will not be able to afford housing in the city if we don't start pushing wages up much more regularly in this city, much more steadily. I think it's very simple. The city of New York is doing things that have never been done before. We're using all our resources. We're putting our money where our mouth is. We need Albany to help. We need Washington to help. What we've gotten used to when we talk about all these issues, affordable housing or mass transit or education, we're used to assuming Washington will never do anything. And that's something I hope is going to change next year in this country. We're used to assuming Albany will do something, but not as much as we need. It's up to us to demand more both from the state government and the federal government, because now you can see with your own eyes that the city government is doing things on a much bigger scale than ever before to protect affordable housing for people. So we're proving our part of the deal. Now we need others to help us as well. Muchas gracias. Por aquí tenemos una persona que no ha preguntado. Mr. Mayor, uh, Your Honor, thank you for being here with us. Um, <clears throat> Your Honor, um, I'm part of a, uh, a program called the Till Program, run by the uh, uh, HPD. And um, we've had a very difficult time. Um, promises are made and promises are broken. Um, rules are changed without us ever seeing anything in writing. We're just told this is the way it is now. And, and we have to accept it. It causes us a lot of stress. I bring one point, the uh, building where I live. Since 2010, I've put in a request to have our roof repaired, an entire roof repair. We got bids of about $27,000. I understand that's a lot of money. Um, well, that's 2010. Within a year, our building coordinator, he's moved to a different position. The person who takes over his position has no idea about the paperwork that was submitted to the prior. Well, now, we've gone through six coordinators 
This is 2010. Finally, we had a meeting with uh, Mark Levine. We had a meeting with um, um, Assemblyman Wright. And we had a meeting with uh, Mr. Higgins from the HPD. He's no longer there. But at that meeting, we were promised that HPD will repair our building. He is gone now. There are new people in place. We're going, we we're going to do better now. I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt because we're going, to, we're going to cut through all the bureaucracy, go straight to the commissioner since she's seated, sitting 10 feet away from you. What's the, what's the address, brother? At 503 West 140, the commissioner is aware. Okay, commissioner, come forward, please. Say it again, 50... 503 West 140, it's Okay, so commissioner, welcome to the firing line. Okay, and so... Please tell us what we can do, what we know we can do for this building, and then obviously you and your team will meet uh, after with the tenants of the building. But what, are you, what is the status as far as you know? Right. So I don't know the specifics of your building. I'm sorry, but we'll talk about it afterwards. But, you know, we are trying very hard to move the till buildings into getting rehabbed and repaired. I don't know what happened with the roof repair, but we will look into it. I'm sorry that there was turnover. We are trying very hard to stabilize that program to make sure that we're, I, under, I understand. Um, and so we're trying very hard to improve that program. One of the things that- Can we confirm there are resources available for this yes, type of repair? absolutely. Okay, so there's resources and the commissioner's not going anywhere. So <laughs> you're gonna deal directly with her. No one will move around in the bureaucracy or go to other jobs. She's got her job. She's staying. So we'll make this work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Tomas. Welcome, Mayor, to our community. I know we're talking about housing, but I would like to talk about the youth a little bit. First, I want to thank you for the support that we have in our after school that we increased the number. Um, now we have the funding for three years. Thank you. I know that we need it for more than three years, but when the three years accomplished, we deal with uh, You're a beside, positive person. That's a positive attitude. Here we go. Besides, I want to thank you because for the support that you're giving for the housing, we're providing at Inwood Community Services that is a CBO that working in this community for 36 years. And we providing to the tenant support for Friday from three to five, from three to seven, I'm sorry. We're there to all the tenants that have problems in your apartment, harassment, whatever issue that you have there, you go to 651 Academy Street and we do our best with the support of the city to take care of the problem. Thank you. Thank you very much for the work you do. We appreciate it. de Tenas de 21 de Arden. Tenemos ocho años que nos removieron de nuestro edificio y pertenecemos a HPD. HPD no ha cerrado la puerta porque la ciudad no tiene dinero para renovar nuestro edificio. No hay nadie que diga nada. Pedimos a Pormen y nadie da a Pormen. Así que yo quiero saber esta noche qué dice la señora respecto a nuestro edificio. Tenemos, yo tengo 30 años que vivo en ese edificio. Idanis, you tell, tell everyone, tell everyone. Just give, give the frame to everyone and Vicky will speak to it. Okay. El, es un caso, Doña María, ¿sí? The lady sitting there. She's the leader, okay? She's quiet, but she's the leader of 21 años. That's kind of leader. <laughs> eh, eh, un aplauso, Doña María. Una, un buen liderazgo, ¿eh? 21 años. Eh, es un proyecto, ocho años, tienen espera. <laughs> They've been waiting for a year. That building, 21 Arden, is one of those that have been given to Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation as a CBO to renovate the building. I know that there's some conversation going on because they, Northern Manhattan say that they need more money from HPD in order to be able to do the renovation. But they've been, very, they've been waiting very patient for many, a year. So any hope that we can do is really needed. Okay, but we're talking about exactly that, right? We're, we're in conversations, and so I think we will be able to work that out. <clears throat> I understand. Okay, but I think we're working. 
equipar el edificio porque es un edificio pequeño. So wait, is, no. is this, we'll just clarify for us, Adonis, is this a building that HPD has been working with? It's a yes. building that HPD is working mm -hmm. on. Again, it's one of those steel buildings. Yes, same no idea. Has mm -hmm. given. Mm -hmm. The question is that now, I also allocated $200,000 in okay. this fiscal year. They just need more money from HPD in mm -hmm. order for Northern Manhattan to renovate the building. Okay, I want to say before Vicky speaks, Again, the accountability measure, I believe I, I started out doing uh, community organizing before I ever ran for anything, so accountability is a very good thing. And the accountability measure is Idanis, is who hosted this meeting with the community organizations, will keep track of the specific issues that came up, and then he will be able to grade us on how we did. That's the first point. The second point is we have put much more in the way of resources into affordable housing so we have more to work with than previous administrations. And I think some of their strategies were wrong too, but we also just have more resources to work with because we've made it a priority. The third thing is, Vicki Bean is the most popular person in the room tonight because <laughs> she has a chance to solve many people's problems and make the community better, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah see? Positive reinforcement. Yeah. And I look forward to doing that. But I also want to say that there was one other factor in all of this, which many of you have experienced, and that is um, in prior years, we had a devil of a time getting through approvals through OMB. Many, you all know, you all have worked with us some for many years trying to get those approvals for the till buildings through OMB. The new OMB is much more cooperative. Things are moving much faster. We are getting the, these um, through the pipeline and look forward to getting yours through the pipeline as soon as possible. All right? Thank you. Segundito, señora, sorry. Usted está bien paciente esperando ya usted. Sí. Buenas noches. Este, yo vivo en el 551 West de la 170. Este, bueno, um, como verán, este, y, hay, he escuchado tantas propuestas y me parecen magníficas. Estoy sorprendida que haya tanta ayuda por parte de la alcaldía. Simplemente que ahora mucha gente que no está aquí para, para escucharla, para saberla. Y mi propuesta es que le demos más empuje a, a que se entere la gente. Nos han quitado bastante ayuda cuando nosotras madres de familia que íbamos a la escuela a que nos dieran asesoría de la comunidad, de lo que éramos, que teníamos derecho, la han quitado. En esos recortes se ha ido muchos, muchos programas de ayuda hacia la familia y más a la latina. Ahora yo creo, sí, estamos trabajando demasiado para mantener un apartamento, estamos trabajando lo doble, estamos descuidando a nuestros niños. Entonces… Yo digo, sí es cierto, yo le agradezco que los de pre-kinder estén yendo a la escuela. Sí es cierto, porque a los niños hay que empujarlos desde pequeños. Pero entonces, los papás tenemos que irnos a trabajar, dejar esos niños a manos de otras personas y ya no estamos asesorados los padres como para saber este derecho que tenemos de vivienda. No sabemos que tenemos abogados gratis, no sabemos que podemos llamar al 311. ¿Entiende? Entonces, tenemos tantas cosas que yo creo que ahorita demos ese empuje, que nos ayude, que haga más campaña para que nos asesoren y que tengamos derechos en nuestras viviendas. Gracias. Gracias. Thank you. What's your name? <laughs> mucho, mucho orgullo. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, and I agree with you. I think, I, think you're, I think you're saying something very important. Because we can make changes, but if people don't know about them, it doesn't help. So, first of all, it's our responsibility as the city to reach out to people in every way. When we did pre-K, we reached out in every community. We had people at subways, we had people at block parties, wherever people were telling parents about pre-K. We didn't cover every place. I know it's a big city, but we had lots of people out spreading the word. The result is today there's almost 67,000 children in pre-K because we reached out to the community and we told people it was there for them. 
We want to do the same thing on so many of the other things we're trying to do. So when we tell you about legal services, and you can call 311, we're going to be spreading that word all over the city. We'll advertise. We'll have all sorts of community organizations help us to spread the word. And I want to say, this is now where everyone has a chance to make a difference yourself. So many people in this room are fighting for the community right now and helping make it a better community. But I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. We're telling you tonight about things that can change people's lives. And there is a common connection between all of these things. They're all free. Pre-K is free. After school is free. The municipal ID card is free. The legal services for people who are being evicted is free. So we need your help telling people this. We need your help telling people that if they're in a rent-regulated apartment and their lease is coming due any time in the next year, there's two options they should be given and only two options. If they want one-year lease, zero percent increase. If they want a two-year lease, two percent increase. If a landlord offers something other than that, they're outside the law. But it takes people to spread that message. The government has a very, very important role. And you're right, we need to do it better. We need to project it better, explain it better, advertise it better. But I also believe in the power of community and the power of people who are active in their community to make the change. So all these tools are there. If you know of a neighbor, a friend, a family member, a coworker who needs this help, I need you to tell them about it. I need you to tell them that the city will help them and that will make a difference. Hi. Voy a hablar en mi idioma español. Por todas las personas que ahora mismo quisieran estar aquí no han podido estar. Eh, se ha hablado de todo, pero sí está surgiendo algo con los dueños de los edificios. Ellos lo están vendiendo y a nosotros lo tenan, no nos informan de que lo van a vender. Al menos yo fui una de las engañadas. Me despertaban a las 8 de la mañana y me decían que era para hacer una, eh, como un contrato con el banco para un préstamo, cuando era mentira, era para vender el edificio. No nos mandaron carta informándonos que lo iban a vender. Después del edificio a ser vendido, entonces fue que nos informaron. La segunda es que los teléfonos que ellos nos mandan a nosotros en carta son teléfonos de Long Island, Wine Plain o, o otros sitios que son dificultades para nosotros porque nunca nos podemos comunicar con el landlord para cualquier problema que uno tenga en el edificio. Y, eso es, y también los apartamentos lo están vaciando. Prefieren dejarlo vacío tres meses, tres años y no alquilarlo porque no lo quieren alquilar a nosotros los hispanos. Un apartamento de un cuarto de dormir viene estando ya casi alrededor de dos mil dólares. Cuando nosotros no estamos en esa posibilidad, porque los que trabajan, lo que es salario que ellos ganan, no le dan para eso. Cuando ellos tienen también familia que mantener y otros biles que pagar. Entonces, los apartamentos lo cogen, lo vacían y no lo quieren alquilar. Y otra sugerencia es que aquí nadie ha dicho, necesitamos en el área de Washington Heights que hagan más edificios para las personas de tercera edad que lo necesitan. Gracias. Okay, so on the first, the first point about landlords selling their building without telling the tenants, so Steve, I want you to come up and talk about the things we could do. If, a, if a, we're talking about a building that's rent regulated, there's different rules than other kinds of buildings, so let's talk about if a, if a landlord sells their building, doesn't tell the tenants, if they start making repairs to harass the tenants, by uh, creating noise or leaving lots of apartments vacant. Let's talk about what can be done. But the second point was about senior housing. So the plan that we have for affordable housing includes 10,000 units, 10,000 more units of senior housing. So that's going to make a big difference for seniors in the city. Plus, we are trying to protect seniors who are being uh, pushed out of their homes. That's the free legal services we talked about. And we've worked to make sure that more and more seniors know when they have a right to a rent discount under the SCREE program, that they get that discount available to them. We also do things to help seniors pay less if they own a home in water bills, to get them, to, uh, that they can get less, uh, they can pay less in their water bill to help lighten their burden. So there's a lot of different efforts that we're doing to help seniors afford their housing. But let's hear now about the answer. If a landlord is not informing their uh, tenants 
and making that kind of change in their building? I mean, the, the main thing to, to consider is if you're in a rent-stabilized building and a new owner buys the building, it's not starting all over again. You have the same rights that you had before. Some of the cases we've seen are exactly like you described. New owner comes in, th tries to say rent stabilization doesn't apply, and lawyers have been very helpful. If you find yourself in that situation, call 311. Don't be afraid. Everybody doesn't have to be an expert. That's why the mayor is funding experts, so that we can provide that kind of assistance to you. And Steve, Steve, how much does that legal assistance cost for everyday New Yorkers? Nothing. Nothing. Very good. But I should also add, it's 10 times the amount of investment that it used to be. Yes. That's why we'll reach 10 times more people. Go ahead. Great. So many questions, many commissioners. The mayor's here. He has spent two hours answering all the questions. We have, okay, let's give him a big round of applause. That call, respect. So, let's give three more questions. Again, one, two, three, Ali. I want to know if there are any rules, regulations, laws about um, and the amount of time a super needs to be in a building available for repairs or issues. That's a very good question. Okay, how is there a law? So you, is it rent regulated or not the building? Rent regulated. Okay, for rent regulated building, is there a rule about how much the super has to be around or what their obligations are? Well, the, the rule is really as to the obligations. So the repairs have to be made whether the super's there or not. So if you have problems with the repairs in your apartment, or if anybody else has problems with the repairs in the apartment, call 311. HPD could get involved, and if you need legal assistance, uh, we can provide you through HRA with legal assistance. The problem that we have calling 311 is that if you're working or if you're not at home, you don't see 311, the HPD people because they you don't know when they're coming, they leave a card on the door, and they're gone, and that's the end of it. Well, I'm going to just say you have us here, we're going to take down your address, and I think we're going to give you the results you want. All right. Yes, thank and, you. Uh, so on the requirement of a super, it depends upon the size of the building, and I apologize, but I don't have that memorized exactly what size of the building that determines when a super has to be there, uh, you know, how many hours, but we will look into your building. We, we know that our inspectors work 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but we know it's very difficult to, to time with your, uh, you know, with your schedule. We're working to have handhelds for all of our inspectors so that they can notify you, so that they can schedule around you, and we hope to have that program rolled out in the next couple so, of years. Hold on, I want to ask so everyone's clear. So mm -hmm. if someone, like many, many people, the only time they can be available is in the evening or a weekend, mm -hmm. What are we? What is our current standard, and what are we trying to do to be able to make sure that the inspectors can be there when the tenants are actually there? What's what's going on? So we try very hard to schedule around the tenants. It's not always possible. Can we, we try. do evenings and weekends? Yes, we have inspectors 24 hours a day, okay. seven days a week. So when you say I want, I'm going to use you as a live example so we can learn something here. Mm -hmm. All right, you wanted you you called in the complaint. And then you're saying that they said they couldn't come to your apartment at night or weekend? They couldn't come when you were around? Three one, yeah, 311 doesn't do that. They route it to us, and then we try to schedule. So what happened in your them. case? Well, uh, several times. I mean, over you know, the years, I've made you know, complaints. And only one, have, one time I you know, was actually there when HPD came. The other times, I've gotten a card in the door. And that was the end of the story. So now, are we able now, and then where are we trying to go, to actually time the visit when the tenant says they'll be there? We are not able to exactly time it around the tenant schedule at this time. We're trying very hard to get there. It it's, requires a huge investment of technology, but that's what the way we're moving. And so. what is your goal for when we'll be able to reach that? It, it's going to take about two years to get it fully operational around the entire city. 
but I, in, whenever we so on a on a complaint like no super is available or something out for the entire building, well, we we will go knocking on doors and say, are you having this problem? Even if we can't reach your particular, I mean, you know, and, right. and it's not just an HPD issue. There are actually a number of issues in the building, and mm -hmm. the super doesn't take care of it. Like what? The landlord doesn't. What kind of issues? It. Right now, we have a big rat infestation. The basement in the building is full of rat. Okay, it's oh. Mary Bassett's chance. Come on, Mary, you haven't, you haven't been called yet. <laughs> Department of Health. <laughs> so, so, what can we do for a rent, reg rent regulated building with a rat problem? Uh, so that's another 311 call. You have to talk about the rats. We'll send out an inspector and we will, the landlord has a responsibility to make the repairs to get rid of those rats. Okay, but in this case, since she's standing right here, what's the address? 725 West 172. Okay, so you and I your need, team. Yes. I'll you get you to are now 311. Yeah. Congratulations. And, and, and say say you, it one more time. I'll tell you what. The one time I did have to go to housing court, the HPD lawyer said, oh, yes, we know that landlord very well. Ah, tell me the address one more time. 725 West 172. Okay, okay. so okay. health department oh, will do exactly a follow-up. exactly where that is. Actually. Okay, see? You're famous. The health department will do a follow-up. And of course, I can say that the Deputy Commissioner HPD in charge of, in charge of uh, overseeing all the inspectors, Victor Vito Monsorelli, has been very great. In our district, anyone, I've been with Vito and my other colleague in the elected office, going with the inspector at 12 midnight, at 11 p.m. So my policy in my district is, if we coordinate it with the tenants and the HPD, we will be there with HPD. So it's a done deal. We will be going to your building in the next couple of days because we have a great day for a commission. So, uh, My name is Aisha Oglevy. I'm actually on the community board for this district. I'm on the Housing and Human Services Committee, and I'm very happy to hear a lot of the things that I'm hearing today. And I want to say to everyone here, your community board is a resource for you. Please come to the community board. We are at 530 West 166th Street. Our housing uh, committee chair is here today. He is a wealth of information. He knows his stuff and he is here to help. That being said, a huge issue that I have is sometimes when you're a family, it's easy to point the finger at the bully outside and address that and pick up the fight against that person. But when the person is a family member who is at the table, who does good, who you love, it's harder to hold them accountable. And that's something that I see in government and in our community, that it's harder when there are entities that we feel do good for our community to hold them accountable. So I stand here today, a tenant, and I came to this fight being an advocate and being someone who doesn't welcome the elephant in the room, I fight against the, the invisible elephant in the room. I live in a building for 36 years that is kind of operates like a two-tier system. I am a rent-stabilized tenant. The building is rent-stabilized. We have 53 apartments, and the owner of the building ha owns many apartments that work the same way. The owner is New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University has like a, is like an affiliate. And what is happening in our buildings is even though we now have this rent freeze, which is fantastic, there are people who live in my building that are never going to get the benefit of that because they are being charged 9 to 11 percent per year. They don't even get the opportunity of having a two-year lease because every year their rent is being raised 9 to 11 percent. People that work for New York Presbyterian Hospital are having their rents raised. They're living six to seven people in a one-bedroom apartment because they can't afford to get people who have disabled uh, family members that maybe they're living in a walk-up on the sixth floor. They won't transfer them to another building that has a first-floor apartment even though they are uh, available. How can we continue to say that affordable housing is important for us when we are allowing entities to usurp the housing stock in this community and use it, claiming that they're doing a benefit for their employees or their students, but they're duping those very people and then making it difficult for people like me who are true rent stabilized attendants to live there because if they get me out, then they can put someone else there that they can raise their rent 9 to 11 percent. Right. right. So I appreciate the question very much. And 
to pick up on your analogy, we respect you know, the institutions of the city, the, the universities and the hospitals and all the institutions that play a key role in the city. But you know what? They're held to the same standard and the same law as everyone else. So if there is a rent-stabilized building and tenants within it are not being treated under that law, that's a problem. So I'm going to turn to Steve, Vicky, whoever knows. I don't know if you know about this particular situation. Because this, this is a very particular one, but what can you say? Uh, a few moments ago, I said that uh, we can take care of some problems and we don't have to depend upon Albany. This is a situation in which the law allows entities to take units outside of rent stabilization, which is the example that you're describing. It's two, it's a, it's some units are in and some units are out. So when an entity is renting uh, the units and renting to their own employees, they're able to take it outside of the protections of rent stabilization. But we can certainly see if there's any particular actions we can take. But as a general matter, the state law permits what you're describing, which is not but, very but let me, let me, let me Let me just jump in for a second. But the, the point you're making, I think, is that it's not just what's happening with those individuals. It's the impact it's having on the whole building right. and on everybody else. So can we, how do we treat that kind of situation if it's creating an undue pressure on the existing... Not, not to tenants? mention that... In a community that you say has the highest housing stock with affordable housing, and they own many of the buildings and they continue to buy buildings, are we really saving anything by instituting a, a rent freeze when most people are not going to get the benefit of that? What are we really saving? Let's, let's clarify. They buy a building. Help me out. I don't know the answer. If, you, if they buy a building with tenants in place under rent stabilization, this... The, How does the state law treat that? The tenants that are protected by rent stabilization are protected, but I, I, I take your point to be, uh, ma'am, and also the mayor's point, but if there are pressures to try to oust people so that more units can be rented, that merits looking into so it. So the will. state law does not stop us from enforcing against that kind of pressure? Correct. So, uh, does, do, using your building as an example, do people have legal representation or do they need legal representation? A big problem is that because these people also work for the hospital. But then, I don't know if you do. There's I'm saying for the people. Even but the people who don't work for the hospital. Well, there's so few of us by now. But you still the because point. Because we're being pushed out. Right, all right. The but time. I'm saying it's a little chicken and egg. I get the point. But I'm saying if you if you live in the building, uh -huh. and to Steve's point, the existing tenants have rights. Using your building as an example, do you have legal representation or do you need legal representation? Many times it's very difficult to get legal representation. And then another reason why I'm very grateful for what I'm hearing today, but people have lost having the rights to that apartment because this is an entity that's too big to fight on your own without the help. What is the address? 720 West 170th Street. Okay, so we want to get you legal representation. Again, with all due respect to the institutions, as Steve said, the existing tenants have rights and those rights have to be recognized. Great. Thank you. Yolanda. Buenas noches. Gracias, señor Mello, por venir a, a oír nuestra inquietud. Y a Dani Rodríguez también. Mi pregunta es, yo tengo un apartamento y tengo veinte y pico de años viviendo en él, pero la helando no estaba cobrando, cambió la bola y no está cobrando siete dólares por cuarto. O sea, yo tengo que mandarle treinta dólares, treinta y cinco dólares con treinta centavos todos los meses. Si yo tengo derecho a seguirle pagando esa cantidad a esa persona o no tengo derecho. Y otra cosa es que el, el Intercom tiene más de 12 años roto, que no funciona. Tengo la prueba aquí mismo en mi celular. Y esa persona no hace nada y está entre medio de dos puertas. O sea, que cuando se enferma una gente, la, la, los bomberos tienen que romper la puerta para poder entrar a sacar a la persona que está enferma. Y si no, vivimos en un cuarto piso como yo, Tendré que bajar enferma sin poder abrir la puerta a los bomberos o a la ambulancia, porque ¿quién se la va a abrir? Y no creo que, que uno pueda vivir en esa condición, que los ah. se burlen tanto de, lo, de, lo, de los inquilinos. Yo soy una persona que tengo mi renta muy ardía, mes por mes se cumple los días primero y los días 28 le estoy mandando el cheque. O sea, okay. que tengo muchas pruebas suficientes. Is this a rent uh, stabilized building, do we know? ¿Qué? Es un edificio regularizado. 
I almost sure, yes. Do you think it is? Un dando privado, yo todos los años me aumentan un tanto por ciento. Sí, yes it is. Okay. O cada so, dos años. It's another version of the same question, Steve, you're getting a lot of business. If a landlord in a rent-stabilized building is not making basic repairs like the intercom working or the door working and all, what does the law say? Uh, a landlord who's a rent-stabilized landlord has to make repairs and keep the building in, in uh, conditions that are habitable. One of the things we've seen and the reason why the mayor has provided the additional legal resources is we see landlords sometimes let buildings deteriorate in conditions as a way of making it uncomfortable for rent-stabilized tenants to remain there. And so if you'll call 301 about your situation, uh, there'll be a follow-up, and someone tonight will also take information so we can look into your situation. Yeah, or separate right. charges, separate yeah. charges. Uh, la boiler, the, la the landlord's supposed to maintain the boiler, but we'll look into the situation, see what we can do to help you. That shouldn't be happening. So let me emphasize that the... Um, as I said at the beginning, we have people here tonight from the city who are going to work on the individual uh, situations that have been raised. I know the commissioners have been taking notes about uh, specific buildings that they'll be following up with. But I want to make sure the people who are here from the city government who work with tenants and help tenants, raise your hands. There's one. Raise your hand. Anyone who is... Anyone? Come on. Stand up and raise your hand so people can see you. If you work for the city, yeah, there's a clipboard. That's a good sign and you help people with their specific problems, make sure I want to say to everyone, if you have a very individual problem, you can see one of our colleagues at the end and they can help do the follow-up. So you don't need to call 311, you need to talk to one of these folks right here in front of you. Right. My, my mistake on that. Council Member Rodriguez points out that in your building, and, I'm, and we'll find out if that's the case, there is a state law that allows the landlord to pass on what's called a major capital improvement. What we have found is sometimes that's passed on in a way that's improper. And so lawyers can help sort that out. Pero usted no me contestó la pregunta. ¿Tengo que seguir pagando la bola o no? Esa es la pregunta. Que la. Es ilegal. La respuesta es de que si el landlord aplicó para la MCR y se lo aprobaron, entonces lo tienen que pagar. Pero cualquiera, como usted vecina de North Manhattan, que está a la misma esquina, Mañana nos aseguramos que María ponga un abogado de ellos para que entonces hable con usted sobre esa pregunta, ¿ok? Ok. Señores, de nuevo, mucha pregunta, mucho comisionado, forma de enseñar el respeto a la comunidad, dedicar a dos horas tomando todas las preguntas que hicimos. Hay muchas más preguntas. For me, it is an honor to have the mayor here spending two hours listening to all those questions, all those concerns in the open set room that we have. Now, let's hear from the great leader in New York City, his closing remark, Bill de Blasio. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, everyone. I want to thank you for the passion, for the passion, for the concern, for the feeling people have for the community, and for everything you're doing to help the community. I want to say, we make change one building at a time, one apartment at a time, one school at a time, one child at a time. This is how we make change. And we are very devoted to making that change and we have a tremendous ally. And I have to say tonight, you've seen part of why I have such respect and such faith in your councilman because he, every single time, every question, I've seen this for years, he feels exactly what you're feeling. He wants to help every family. That is something special in public service. Let's thank Idanis Rodriguez for all he does. But I'll conclude with this. Uh, I believe in accountability for government. I've said that we're going to, we're going to turn to Adonis for the results of this meeting to make sure that we follow up with every issue that's been raised tonight. So I want you, please, if, talk to the people. You're going to have meetings with the commissioners. You're talking to our colleagues who work with tenants and work with the community. I want you to see results from this meeting. If you see results, and you're satisfied, you don't need to call us and tell us, although it's always nice. But if you don't see results, I want you to tell Councilmember Rodriguez and his office, because this is part of what we need to do to hold our own agencies accountable. Let's face it. Let's face it. For decades, 
city agencies were not as responsive as they should have been to communities. We are trying to change it. The change doesn't happen overnight. The folks here, I can tell you, I didn't choose every single one of them, but I chose a lot of them. Uh, I chose them because they believed in making these changes, because they were committed. And if you watch them day in and day out, it'll give you a little more faith, because these are people who work extraordinarily hard on your behalf. And when they hear these kind of situations, they want to fix it, they want to do something about it. I've seen it with my own eyes many, many times. So help us to be accountable. Let us know if it's working or not. Use the services we're talking about. The example we just heard a moment ago uh, about uh, Columbia Presbyterian. Whatever the situation, if we're saying call 311 because you can get legal help, we're telling people they have rights. Use those rights. Don't assume that it's not for you. Use the rights and tell other people about the rights so that we can make a change. But I want to thank you all for everything you're doing to improve the community. And what I said in the beginning, I will say at the end. You have a partner, you have a friend, you have an ally at City Hall, and it's my honor to serve you. Muchas gracias a todos.